Hey everyone, my name is Mike Sipos and I'm the UF IFAS Extension Florida Sea Grant Agent in Collier County. And today we're gonna fillet one of my favorite fish out there. I know I've probably said that in past videos. If you watched my other videos before, but this is truly my favorite fish. It is the hogfish. So these things are super cool, got really awesome life history traits. And they're so much so my favorite that I have an aluminum cutout of one on my wall right behind me. So please uh, watch the video, read the description. I include plenty of information in there that I can't talk about in the video just based on time, uh, as well as uh, answer the evaluation survey in the description link too. Um, that helps us determine if we should keep on making these videos and justify the time I spend researching them and my personal time to going out there and uh, capturing these fish so we can uh, make more of these videos and uh, talk about how cool they are. So um, watch more to learn more about the fish and I'm going to go ahead and move the camera so you can get a better look at my hands and we'll start filleting. Okay guys, so here we have our beautiful hogfish. Let's take a second and look at them. They're super, super awesome. Um, to give you an idea for scale of this fish, he is uh, 28 and a half inches maximum total length. So that's to the very tip of the tail, to the very front of the nose. Um, however, uh, with this species, we measure them at the fork lengths, and that's for regulation purposes. So uh, as you can see, these really long sort of liars on the tips of their tails can give them an additional couple of inches that can vary between individuals. So we measure them right here. And for that, he's about 24 inches and weighs about 9.3 pounds. So this is a rather large hogfish. The state record is actually 19.8 or 19 pounds 8 ounces and that was in uh, 1962 in Florida. And then the IGFA world record is 21 pounds 15 ounces and that was caught in uh, South Carolina in 2011. So there's bigger ones out there but uh, you know if you, if you get, I, I believe the world records are based on hook and line and uh, these are very common to spear. Um, so they're, they're not as common hook and line, but nowadays people are figuring out how to catch them um, using shrimp and different kind of methods on inshore reefs, especially around the Tampa area. But these are super cool fish. Um, they're protogenous hermaphrodites, so they're born females and then they become males later on in life based on social cues of their like harem. So they breed in these populations where it'll be one male and five to up to 15 females. And uh, the, the, the largest female, if the male dies, will become the new male. And that takes a, a couple of weeks to a couple of months. I believe I read it's about two months or so for them to transition. Um, the habitat, they live in rocky reefs and ledges. Little guys will live around like patch reefs and seagrass beds, just depending on where you're at in Florida. They're more common in the South Florida area, but there's a big population in the Big Bend. Um, but in the Panhandle, they're not as common. But once you get towards the Keys and uh, you know the, the East Coast over there, you'll see them pretty often. Um, they're you know very deep-bodied fish, so really wide, but they're pretty compressed, so it's not very um, wide that way. And they, they can be a very uh, like a, 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 a assortment of colors. Usually, it's about this pattern, where males will have this really dark pigmentation that almost looks like a mask and their nose becomes more, uh, their snout becomes more like protrusible, like this, this mouth can sort of move in and out if it was more fresh, if you see that, that's sort of cool. So they use that nose to actually dig, and that, that, that snout to dig into the sediment where they eat a lot of these invertebrates and mollusks and crustaceans, so they could eat clams, um, gastropods, like snails, uh, sea urchins, uh, so they're, they're mostly those invertebrate and crustacean eaters. They don't really eat fish, but we've actually had one uh, <laughs> uh, on a piece of fish. You know, there's, a, there's a accidents caught every day. But um, the, the oldest live, known uh, hogfish aged by FWC was 23 years old. Um, that, uh, at the time of their sex change, they're all born female, remember? But they have that in social cue. So, um, you know, once that big male dies or it moves on or that, that female separates from the group, uh, they'll start transitioning to a male at about three years and, and that correlates to about 14 inches. But in populations where there's you know, a really healthy population of hogfish, the females can get uh, rather large because there's no pressure to have them change. 
and that's really good and based on uh, their pop the, their population health because a, a female that's larger can produce way more eggs than a smaller female and uh, the size at maturity is about uh, seven inches for a female but then with those males like I said they change around 14 to 15 inches in length and that's like about 50% maturity 50% of the population will mature at those lengths um, and yeah, they spawn around the spring and winter time uh, where they'll, you know, they'll have these really cool behaviors where a male will just sort of sit there and sort of dance around females Sometimes they'll flare their fins up and down. They have these really elongated dorsal fins that they can make really cool pat or really cool movements with. And then once they're ready, they'll both rush to the surface. And this sort of happens um, not not a very very high to the surface, but you know a couple feet off the ground. They'll both rush to the surface that direction, and they'll spew their gametes, their eggs, and their sperm, and fertilize. And uh, a male can do this multiple times during a day and females can spawn multiple times during a season. And uh, those eggs hatch within 24 hours in the pelagic larval duration. How long that little thing's like a super small larvae and then turns into a baby hogfish is about 26 plus or minus three days. So it varies in the literature. I've read you know, that number, I've read about 30 days or so, but it, it's around that time. So let's go ahead and start filleting them before I, <laughs> I take up too much time and I'll, I'll pepper in some facts in there. So it's really hard to misidentify this fish. They're so, so unique. Um, but a lot of times people call them hog snapper and they're not actually snapper, they're a type of wrasse. And they're the largest Western Atlantic wrasse out there. So you might be familiar with different wrasses when you're diving, scuba diving. Um, there's uh, the Cuban hogfish that you might've seen and that's sort of a red and yellow variety. Um, and then there's also the Spanish hogfish, which is sort of a, a yellow and purplish variety. And those are pretty common if you're around the South Florida reef area. So I'm making that incision all the way up to the head. You know, I'm not really cutting right here because then you'll miss a lot of that head meat. And as those males sort of become more like a terminal, like alpha male phase, this nose can be way more dramatic. Uh, this pigmentation can be very dramatic too. So you want to make sure you get as much meat as possible because these things are super tasty and we want to make the most out of them. So I'm going to be cutting along this area, sort of using your finger as a guide. If you feel that gill plate area, you know, just sort of avoid that and cut where it starts getting soft and start cutting down. And then I am going to lift the fillet and then start skimming that spine. So you want to hear that washboard sound because that means you're getting all those ribs there, the vertebrae, and getting all the meat out of them. So these fish are super, super, super tasty. Um, they're really revered as being one of the best tasting out there, uh, which makes them really popular for restaurants in the commercial and recreational sector. Um, since there aren't really big hook and line sort of eaters out there, most people harvest them using spears, but there has been some trap fisheries out there and even some trawl fisheries I've heard. And they can be found um, from the Bermuda area, North Carolina, all the way down to about Brazil. And they inhabit those reefs and those ledges. There's that one piece of fillet, that's a nice hefty fillet right here. And then we're gonna turn them around and do the other side. And they'll, they'll, you'll find, see them more often in about 100 feet or so. You know, you can see them on up to 200 foot, but they, they inhabit that area because they, they like to live in those reefs. And if you see a smaller hogfish, they'll be more mottled. They'll, they'll, they'll look like this, but it's not really good camouflage if they look like that, but they could really change their colors and get patches on them. And sometimes you'll see them just sort of hanging upside down amongst the sea fans that they like. And sea fans don't really live in super, super deep water because a lot of times they photosynthesize as well as, you know, filter feed for food. So they want to live where they can, you know, hide and uh, become not food for other predators. But the little guys will live in those patch reefs and even seagrass beds in some areas, but they'll, they'll migrate to the larger reef structure as they grow and further offshore.
So I'm making that cut along the spine again. Got that good. And I'm trying to feel around where that head sort of stops and the fillet starts, making that incision. Outlining the gill plate area and cutting straight down. And uh, hogfish are a great fish that if you if you haven't if you're not a seafood fan um, because they don't really taste like anything they taste pretty much like the sauce that you cook them with or the season that you cook them with it's a very delicate fillet in terms of taste that is a, a favorite amongst many. Making that cut, lifting up, cutting, lifting, cutting. Cutting around the ribs, cutting down and over. And there's our filleted hogfish. And then I'm gonna move this fillet closer to the edge of the table so we can start taking the skin off. And usually I like to hover pretty, uh, not far, but a couple set, uh, millimeters above the skin. But with these, there's not very much of that red muscle tissue that has that myoglobin and uh, associated more with like maybe that fishier taste. So you could get right up against the skin when you're filleting them. So I'm, I'm uh, hanging my knife edge over the edge of the table to make it flush with the fillet and doing a sawing and pulling motion and at a slightly downward angle. And here we go. That's one fillet right here. Skin. Pretty good yield on that. And I'm gonna go ahead and do the other one before I trim them up. And uh, yeah, since these fish are um, living in these reefs and deep water kind of environments, really just depending on where you're at. The more south you go, the more common you'll see them. And you know, where there is reef, which is shallower, if you're in the Keys, that could be in five or 10 feet. But if you're you know, off of Fort Myers, where I'm at, you won't really start seeing them. You can see them in shallow, but the ones that are actually legal to be harvested are probably in about 60 to 100 feet, just depending. So I got these two fillets but they have a, a Y bone or the rib cage area. So you want to use your finger and sort of feel up of where that occurs. So like it's right about here, you know, uh, feel it up. It's going to be about four inches or so into the fillet cut on either side of it. And there you go. There's your bone there. I'll put that off to the side and that's ready to go on the pan. I like to fry them. I like to blacken them. There's no bad way of cooking hogfish. But yeah, since they live in these reef areas and you can catch them in deeper depths and they don't really have that much room to expand, their swim, they can suffer barotrauma. And barotrauma is when their swim bladder expands and the ga dissolved gases in them it expands and displaces their organs. And since these guys are eating a lot of these crustaceans, um, they have these things called pharyngeal jaws inside the mouth that um, crush down the shells of all those crustaceans and mollusks for them to um, process them. So if you ever gut them, it almost looks like a puka shell necklace because they have so much uh, shell inside there. And you can see where the stomach sort of inverted. I got them in a really deeper depth. Oh, and oh, here's that shell I was talking about. Um, but uh, the, uh, instead of their stomach coming out of their mouth that you see in like a lot of grouper species, a lot of times their intestines will start coming out of their anus. So if you're catching them and you're catching a whole bunch of them and not intended to catch them, um, you know, maybe move your spot or use some barotron mitigation techniques, whether that's venting. So when you vent a fish, you want to go right over here, right where that, that sort of pectoral fin area, this pretty yellow pectoral fin is, and use that as a guide and insert your venting needle right here. And that's puncturing the swim bladder to let them go back down so they're not floating on the surface and relieve some of that pressure on the inside. Or using a descending device like a sequelizer that clips onto their mouth and brings them back down to depth. Because, um, yeah, they're, 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 uh, the, the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch listed them as either a, a, a good species alternative that you could eat. Um, however, the, the, the landings of them are like slightly declining in Florida consistently. So we want to make sure that the populations are healthy so we can enjoy them for years to come. So look up uh, baritrauma mitigation techniques for them. And yeah, 
there you have it. There's your hogfish. So beautiful fillets here. And thanks for watching. Please take the valuation uh, so, so we can uh, justify making more of these videos. And uh, stay tuned for more fish species. Thanks, guys.